Back, back in the 1700s, there were two very well-known theologians and evangelists that lived side by side, and their names were George Whitfield and John Wesley, and they were really powerful. They preached the word. Um, they were so, um, everybody knew them, everybody wanted to hear what they had to say, but the two of them had some minor theological differences, and they, would, they could never reconcile those two differences. And one time somebody came up in a personal discuss, uh, conversation and asked George Whitfield a question. They asked him, do you think you will see John Wesley in heaven? And he waited a few moments to answer, and he said, I fear not. And everybody was wondering, how could this be? And the next way, the way he answered was, I fear not because he will be so close to the throne of God, he will be so far with Jesus, then I will be so far behind that I will not even see him in heaven because he is so much, he'll be so much closer to God. And this is a, just a demonstration of humility. Humility of one person that did not want to cause conflict because both of them were preaching the gospel, both of them were causing people to be saved worldwide, and he did not want that there to be a wedge between them. And this was a great example of humility. And I wanted to thank uh, Alina for saying that wonderful verse because it's exactly what I would, I'm going to be talking about, the ex exact verses you read. And we see how God leads even this service in such things as or orchestrating everything together so, the, so that we can worship him together. We're continuing our study in, in Philippians chapter 2, and we'll be reading from verse 8 through 11. This is one of the greatest uh, texts in the New Testament, the, the text that we just heard from Alina reading. And we, last time we, we read the whole section, we focused on the first part, the humiliation of Jesus Christ, how he, was, how he went from glory down to the lowest part, the lowest kind of humiliation any person could ever experience. And today we will read more about his exaltation, how God lifted him up to glory, that, the kind of glory that no one uh, could ever imagine. So the title of my sermon is From Humil Humility to Exaltation. Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11. And being found in... In appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." What a wonderful, wonderful passage. And like I said last time, that this was actually sung, a hymn that was sung in the early church so that it can help people remember the theology. Just if we look at this whole passage, we see how deep it is. It shows the, the essence of why Jesus came to earth, who he was before, and then uh, what he experienced, the death of the cross, and how he was lifted up to glory. I would like to share just three points from what we read today to kind of help us see what humility looks like and what Jesus experienced and what, it, what humility does for, for G, what it did for Jesus and what it can do for us. So three things I would like to focus on. First is humility always comes at a cost. Second, we will look at that humility always comes with a reward. And lastly, we'll look at that how... Humility always comes with difficulty. It is not something that comes natural to humans, and we'll talk about that last. So first, how uh, humility always comes at a cost. The cost that Jesus experienced, we read it about it just a little bit in verse 8. It says, And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The death of the cross, it wasn't enough that he just died any ordinary death. That would not suffice the, the, the wrath of God because he had to die on the cross specifically. And the, the cross was a torturous instrument of uh, death because 
it delayed the process of dying for sometimes many, many hours, even sometimes days, as if somebody, we know that John the Baptist was beheaded, and that sounds so cruel and so just some, something we could not, not even imagine, but that was instantaneous death. But Jesus experienced torture and, of which we could never imagine, and the pain that he experienced was voluntary for our sake. He did that willingly. And we know that the death of Jesus is the most important event of all of his life. When we look at how the Gospels are spread out, we see that uh, there's only a few chapters at, at his birth, and then there's a few more uh, about his early childhood, just a few things here and there. Most of it is focused on the three years of ministry, and mostly, especially John, he focuses entirely on the last few weeks, uh, just uh, on the death and resurrection of Christ. That's the pinnacle of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Some people want to want to imagine Jesus as just a baby in the manger because that's a really comfortable way to imagine Jesus because it's just a baby and a helpless baby. But we know that the most important part of Jesus' life was the death of the uh, on the cross. That's what he came for. Because even in Revelation it says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. So even before the world was created, the lamb was already slain because the first sermon we heard that God doesn't live in time. For him, a thousand years is the same as one day. So for God, for Jesus, the fact that just the thought that, yes, I will come down to earth in maybe five, six thousand years later was the same thing as him dying at that moment because he was already slain in his mind because there's no, God doesn't live in the realm of time. And we see that how the, all the... Uh, Pre-New Testament people, they looked forward to the, God, uh, to the cross, and everybody now f from the post-New Testament, we look back to the cross, and it brings us to the, to the point where God me, me, uh, unites us with, uh, with man because Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. So humility is going to be painful for us. It's never going to be as painful as what Jesus experienced because he already uh, took the, the sins, uh, on him, uh, our sins on himself. And there's a passage in Hebrews 12.4 that says that we will never have to suffer as, as much as Jesus did for, for our sins because it says there, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Shed, shedding your blood. Jesus, remember how his blood was being poured out from his veins as he was in Gethsemane and how he poured out his blood on the cross for us. We will never have to pay such a deep uh, sac a sacrifice or cost for humility, but it will always cost us something. If we want to live a life of humility, it will cost us our relationships. Sometimes it will cost us many different things. It will cost us our reputation a lot of times. It will cost us our self-worth. It will cost us, uh, maybe sometimes we will not get something that we want because we, we act in humility and we let the other person have something. Or sometimes it will cause our pride to be stepped on. It will always, sometimes just uh, letting the other person win the argument that maybe is not a very important thing, but we fight about small things. And we're just letting the other person win the argument is uh, just acting in humility, that will cost us, but we know that do, acting in humility will always cause us to reap a reward, just as Jesus, when he humbled himself, he, God exalted him higher than any, any, uh, uh, anything, any man, and we'll see in the next few verses how every tongue will confess and every knee will bow before the Lord. Are you willing to lose an argument sometimes for the sake of humility, just like uh, John, uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield, they had disagreements, but George Whitfield was able um, to just humble himself and say, yes, um, he did not want to cause a division between the people that were hearing the gospel and being saved because of minor di disagreements that they had theologically. The second point I'd like to focus on next is the humility, that humility always comes with a reward. Humility always comes with a reward. Yes, it costs us something. It, it costs Jesus his life, but it comes with a great reward. It came with a reward for Jesus, and yet it will also come with a reward for us if we are faithful to obey Jesus Christ and to suffer for his sake. 
So the world treated Jesus with, uh, with rejection, with uh, just completely rejecting everything he did, but God the Father treated him with uh, exaltation. It was the exact opposite. And we see how even his closest disciples, they rejected him at the end, and they ran away. They did not stay, stay with him. Everybody rejected him, but the Father exalted him to the glory of heaven. And we see that the exaltation of Jesus uh, consisted most likely in four different stages. And the first one was his uh, resurrection. God proved his exaltation by raising God uh, to glory on the third day. If he did not raise Jesus from the dead, then his dying was in vain. And then next step was ascension. He, was, he ascended to the glory and he, he is ever present with the Father. And he said, such, uh, in John 20, verse 17, he said, I am ascending to the Father and your Father. I am going to my God and your God. He's uniting us. He's saying, my God is the same as your God when you trust in you, me and you walk in humility. And then the next thing we looked at is his dominion or the verses that we read from verse 9 through 11, just the glory he has, the dominion and all the authority that is given to him. That is the next step of his exaltation and also we see that the last thing is that he intercedes for us. He's the great interceder between us and God the Father. Lots of times we, we stumble, we sin, but we know that Jesus is praying for us. He's interceding for us. And what a wonderful thing it is to know that God is all, uh, Jesus is always stepping in for us when we sin and when we disobey him. And here in this verse, we see that God gave Jesus the name that makes him higher than any other name. Let's read verse um, 8 and 9. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And then verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name of which, which is above every name. Name above every name. The name that is referred to here is the name Lord. As we see in verse 11, it says that, every, that at every, every knee should, uh, um, verse 11, every tongue shall confess and that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the title is given Lord to Jesus Christ, the name Lord. We know that Jesus is his uh, earthly name. Christ is his, uh, his mi ministry. His mission was uh, Messiah. But the Lord God, when he approved of his humiliation and exalted him, he gave him the name Lord, the name Lord. This name is, was so uh, holy for the Jews, they did not pronounce it for uh, hundreds and thousands of years. They, they just used the vowel, the, the consonants without the vowel, so we do not even know how it was properly pronounced, Yahweh or Jehovah or another way, because it was, they feared this was so holy. The name of the Lord was so holy. And if we read Isaiah, uh, Apostle Paul was quoting from an Old Testament passage in Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45 verse 23 actually talks this, the same, uh, same idea that is Apostle Paul is saying in these verses. Let's read verse 23 together. It says, By myself I have sworn from my mouth, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. So we see here, the, the section is really long. If you want to look at it at home, the whole chapter 45 is God talking, to, uh, talking about how he will lift up and, uh, the, the Messiah. And then if we look at, if you look at verse 5, it talks about who, who's talking to it and says, I am the Lord and there is no other. So if you, you see that God is saying, I am the Lord. And then he says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. So in this, Jesus, he's saying that Jesus is the Lord. He, Jesus is the Lord. And that's the name that God gave him in these verses that we just read. The name of the Lord Jesus does not just mean the Lord in general, but it means my Lord. That's the difference here. And just like we remember Thomas Whenever he saw the Lord resurrected, he said, my Lord and my God. Not just Lord in general, he was my Lord. And just what we looked at in John when he said, your father and my father, he is our Lord, all, uh, the same Lord that is the Lord of Jesus Christ. 
And then the last point I would like to focus on is that humility always comes with difficulty. Humility is not something that comes naturally. And I know that this is something is sometimes really hard to talk about because how do you know that you have humility? Because as soon as you start talking about it, we know that we just lost our humility because we're saying, oh, I'm so humble. And we, don't, we do not usually walk around telling people we are humble. But this is something we learn, something we strive. And this is not a natural-born character in any human being. This is something that is learned. Sometimes people are born very shy, and they kind of mix shyness up with humility. Because some, some person can be very shy, but at the same time very proudful. So being shy is not being humble. And at the same time, a person is born very active, very social, and that does not necessarily mean that he's very prideful. It might be a very, very humble person. That's just their character. But humility is a character that we have to learn, that God gives us, that when, when we see it demonstrated in, in Jesus Christ, then we have the ability to uh, copy the example of Jesus or mimic what Jesus did for us. So through humility, though humility doesn't come naturally, but it is a very essential character that we have to have. And we can never please God without humility. And we know there's so much verses that we can talk about humility. But I wanted to mention just a few that say that hum uh, humility is essential. Because uh, we know that a prideful person will never admit that he is, let's say somebody is drowning and somebody is trying to save himself. If a person does not admit that he needs to be saved, it's really hard to save such a person because they think they can do something on their own. A prideful person will all say, I want to, I'll do something on my own. I'll try to save myself. Remember what James said in James 4.10? We, we went through this epistle years ago, but I'm sure this will come to our mind if, as we look at what James says. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humble yourself. Humility leads to exaltation. There's many verses that uh, phrase the same idea that if you, if you show humility, that God will exalt you. But the key is that in God's time. If we read Peter, the Apostle Peter, he adds a very important key that says, yeah, God will exalt, but in his time. Sometimes we want to, we act in a humble way and we say, okay, I did something for you, Lord. I acted this way and immediately we want the gratification. But sometimes it takes many, many years for God to uh, raise, exalt somebody to the point where God wants them to be. First Peter 5, 6 is the verse that talks about this humbling ourselves and God lifting us up. First Peter 5, 6 says, Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. God has his own time. And there's even a really wonderful song. Sometimes we sing, in his time, God makes all things beautiful in his time. God has a timing for us, and we have to just trust in the Lord. The last part of this verse we just read, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He cares for me, and if we just uh, wholeheartedly accept this, that God cares for us and he knows what's best for us, and we just trust God and humbly walk before our God. And so let, let's consider the everlasting dominion of Jesus, the, the dominion of Jesus Christ. So if we look at verse 10 and 11. Let's look at these verses close up again. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should, shall bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I said in the beginning that humility does not come uh, easily. It comes with difficulty. Even for Jesus Christ, it was difficult. We know that even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, was, he was fighting against this, his body because his body was willing, it was was almost to the point of giving up, but then he said, not my will, but your will. And he knew that's what he came for. It was difficult for Jesus, and how much more difficult it will be for us to walk in the way of humility. But then we see how, how glorious the 
exaltation of God was for Jesus that it says here, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. We see that in, in bowing the knee, this talks about the physical submission that everybody will bow down. And you might say, since this verse, verse says, every knee shall bow, does that mean that even those people that do not believe Jesus, they will be saved? Is that what this verse is saying? And we, will, we understand that from other teachings that this is not, does not talk about universal salvation, that every single person will be saved no matter what, whether they accept Jesus or not. This is talking about uh, that every person, whether willingly or by constraint, will accept the authority of Jesus Christ. And how much greater is, it is for us to willingly, while we are still alive, while God gives us the chance to hear the gospel, to accept it and live out the gospel and to accept Jesus as our king rather than wait to the point when he will force every person, when he reveals himself and shows who he is in his glory, and then everybody will, every knee will bow and every tongue confess, and we, like the Jews will see whom they have pierced, and they will confess because they will see, and they, say, they will say, we, we always heard about the gospel, but we never believed, and how much greater it is for us, and there's maybe somebody here that still does not know Jesus Christ person. Maybe they have not accepted his uh, authority and dominion over themselves and walked humbly before the Lord. And we still have this uh, opportunity to walk humbly with the Lord. And before we finish, I would like to look at another prophecy that uh, the prophet Daniel said in his uh, book, Daniel 7, 13, and 14, these are the verses that uh, I think Apostle Paul was also borrowing from whenever he was writing these verses. I think he was looking back into Daniel. Into, sometimes he looked into different prophecies, but specifically in Daniel, we see how glorious the, the Son of Man will be and the Ancient of Days. Let, let's read it together. I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. If we just look at this, we can understand Daniel wrote this hundreds of years before Jesus ever lived, and we, we know that this could not be talking about a mere, mere man because how could it be a son of man yet the, at the same time an ancient of days whose kingdom will never be destroyed. Daniel was talking prophetically about Jesus Christ, about this moment when, yes, he humbled himself, but God exalted him and gave him the dominion and every knee shall bow. And he gave him the name above every name. And we see that every knee shall bow. This is talking about that physically bowing our knees before the Lord. Let's just all, um, willingly bow our knees. Let, let's hope that there will never be a moment when somebody here, maybe you heard the gospel for many years and you did not willingly bow the knee because then God will force you to bow the knee before the glorious King of Kings and to confess his glory. We know that even when Jesus was present on the earth, there was sometimes demons that absolutely did not um, worship God, but they uh, acknowledge, acknowledged who Jesus was. They said s things like, um, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. Why did you come down before, your uh, before our time to, to torture us? They would say stuff like that. They, and Jesus always said, get, away, get behind me, Satan, or he rebuked them because he did not want to accept praise from the demons because they were saying this out of fear because they knew what their end was. But how much greater it is for us that we can hear the, the gospel and accept it willingly in humility, accept what God has done for us. We can worship Jesus today. And in conclusion, before we pray, I just wanted to, wanted to ask, what are the implications of this passage for us? Yes, it sounds really beautiful, it's a good message, to, good, good passage to memorize and to live by, but what does it really mean for us? Can, can this mean, does this change anything in our life personally? 
And I wanted to say, yes, it does. It's a very, very important passage for us. And let's look at another passage. And this will be the last message, passage we will look at talk, that talks about the glorification of Jesus and at the same time that we will have the same kind of glory that God gave Jesus Christ. And this is Romans 8, 16 and 17. These verses are amazing. It talks about the Spirit. Um, we, we probably heard this verse so many times, but if we consider in the, this passage as we read it that the glory that Jesus has is the same kind of glory we will have if we are obedient to him. So Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Provided we suffer. We know that suffering for Christ, suffering in humility for Christ is what makes us uh, what uh, qualifies us to be the next part, which is glorified with God. When we suffer, when we give up of ourselves, like we talked in the beginning, humility will always cost us something. When we give up of our own will, of our own desires, and say, I would rather live for God, for the glory of Jesus Christ, because I know that in the future God will give the glory that he gave his son, will, he will give us also this glory, and we'll be with him in heaven. And right now we have the opportunity to raise uh, our Lord in prayer and glorify him as we uh, can close in prayer. Let's, let the name of the Lord be glorified. Amen.